thank you very much for coming here. You know, such a great crowd. Um, actually, we have two separate small screens uh, in the next room and one in the lobby because there's too many people. So uh, this is very exciting. Uh, my name is Marion Fourquet. I am the director of Social Science Matrix. And of course, it's always very exciting to start a new semester of, of events. But today's uh, is particularly exciting, not only because we have an amazing panel, but also because we have in our midst uh, Berkeley's uh, um, Social Science Matrix former director, <laughs> William Hanks. Uh, and so that's very special because you know, of course, we wouldn't be here uh, without him, um, and none of this would be would be possible. He was the person who really uh, got Matrix off the ground and and uh, turned it in, into, uh, you know, what I'm trying to uh, um, uh, that, that pursue today. So I also want to take a brief moment, you won't hear me, but I want to take a brief moment uh, to thank another uh, Matrix stalwart, uh, our postdoc, Julia Zizek. So not only has Julia put together this wonderful panel, and indeed she has put together much of our spring programming, but she will actually introduce all of our subsequent events uh, this term as I go to the East Coast next week for the remainder of the semester. So Julia, you will, if you come back to Matrix, you will see uh, Julia a lot. So the topic of today's discussion hits very close to home. Our presenter and discussants will address the politics of unnaming buildings on campus. We are meeting today in a building that is known as the Social Sciences Building, but it used to be called, of course, Barrows Hall. And sometimes uh, some of us still make the mistake of referring uh, to this building as Barrows Hall. Andrew Garrett, a professor of linguistics here at Berkeley, has written about another building on this campus that has been unnamed, what is now known as the Anthropology and Art Practice Building, but was formerly uh, Crowbar Hall. So in this new book, Garrett writes about not only the politics of unnaming, but considers other questions about you know, how to think about the legacies of controversial figures, including people like Crowbar, whose work has largely uh, been forgotten within the discipline of anthropology. And so he offers a look into Kroeber's life just up the road here, actually, uh, uh, on Art Street, and what his work with indigenous people throughout the state did, both then and now. We would also like to thank our co-sponsors who helped our esteemed discussants uh, reach this campus. Um, the Joseph A. Meyer Center uh, for Native American Studies, the Department of Ethnic Studies, the Department of Linguistics, and the Department of Anthropology. Uh, as always, I will mention a few upcoming events. Next month, we will have a Matrix on Point. These are signature uh, uh, thematic panels. Uh, that one will be about the intersection between um, biometric identification, surveillance, and privacy. Um, and in March, we'll have an, uh, another, and our next author meets critic in this series uh, will be on Terracine by Salah Mameni. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Leanne Hinton. So Leanne uh, Hinton is Professor Emerita of Linguistics here at Berkeley. Her recent research has focused on language revitalization of Native American languages. She strongly supports interdisciplinary approaches to to linguistics and linguistic research that relates to community needs and interests, as well as to theory. Though retired, she remains active in research and consulting. Awards include the Lanan Foundation's Cultural Freedom Award, the Linguistic Society of America's Language, Linguistics and the Public Award, the Hubert Howe Bancroft Award, presented by the Bancroft Library, library uh, Berkeley's own um, uh, and the Honored One Award presented by the Association of Tribal Archives uh, and Libraries. So without further ado, I'll now turn it over to Leanne. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, good. Um, I have a few brief words to say be, just before introducing our panelists. Um, I was not in favor of unnaming Kroeber Hall. 
Of the other four scholars whose names have been stripped from our buildings, Moses, LeConte, and Bolt, for their own clear and damaging views on racism and white supremacy, and for Barrows for his condescending and insulting justifications of the colonization of the Philippines. Krober was not a racist. He was not a white supremacist, those, although those were claimed about him. In fact, he had many deep and, um, and respectful friendships with Native Americans. He was a mentor to Navy, Native scholars and an advocate for indigenous rights. Moreover, his giant legacy of cultural documentation has become important to many Native Americans today. I felt that Krober was being pilloried by the various charges against him. And Andrew agrees with this. As he writes on page four of his book, the specific claims about Krober's work offered in support of unnaming Krober Hall, accepted by many at Berkeley and beyond, are erroneous or unsubstantiated. But Andrew convincingly wrote in his own letter of support for the unnaming and in his book and that uh, uh, the unnaming should take place anyway, that it was Krober's era of anthropology, that not the sins of a particular anthropologist, that the unnaming was really about. As he writes one more time, that name brought pain to those who should feel welcome in the 21st century, an edifice with anthropo anthropological tenets need not take its name from an era of extractive, patronizing academic attitudes toward Native people. So I want to thank Andrew for this truly insightful book that helps us to a deeper understanding of Probert's own life and contributions, and at the same time delves into the university's own, and I'll do one more quote, foundational ongoing systemic contributions to the displacement and erasure of indigenous people. And perhaps make some of us take a closer look at our own legacies as well. And now on to our panelists. I'm going to just introduce them all. Uh, first, Andrew Garrett. He's a professor of linguistics and the Nadine B. M. Tang and Bruce L. Smith Professor of Cross-Cultural Social Sciences in the Department of Linguistics, where he directs the California Language Archive. His research and teaching are in historical linguistics, especially Indo-European historical linguistics, and in language documentation and revitalization, especially involving indigenous California languages. From the Linguistic Society of America, he's received the Best Paper in Language Award 2015 for Ancestry Constrained Phylogenetic Analysis Supports the Indo-European Step Hypothesis, <laughs> co-authored with three students. And, the, uh, and he also has the Kenneth L. Hale Award in 2023 for outstanding work on the documentation of a particular language or family of languages that is endangered or no longer spoken. In 2001, he has collaborated with the Yurok tribe on the documentation and revitalization of the Yurok language, preparing a short pedagogical grammar, Basic Yurok, in 2014. William F. Hanks studies the history and ethnography of Yucatan, Mexico, and Yucatec Maya language and culture including early modern Spain and Spanish as a necessary step towards understanding the colonial formation of Yucatan and New Spain. He examines the organization and dynamics of routine language use, semantics, pragmatics, interactional sociolinguistics, and the social foundation of speech practices. He has studied ritual practice, comparative shamanisms, and the relation between religion and healthcare in rural Mexico. His most recent uh, work concerns the colonial history of Yucatan and New Spain, with a special emphasis on missionization and the emergence of colonial discourse genres. And at the end of the table, um, Julian, Julian Lang, uh, Wiat Karuk, is a storyteller, poet, art, uh, artist, graphic designer, and a writer. He's a first language speaker of Karuk and a tribal scholar. Julian is the chairman of the Karuk Language Committee, director and founder of the Institute of Native Knowledge, and the author of Arara Pikva, 
Karuk Indian uh, literature from Northwest California. He currently teaches elementary and high school Karuk language classes and is a longtime master speaker in the master apprentice program and, and a board, board member for the Advocates of Indigenous California Language Survival. And then back one from Julian <laughs> is uh, James Clifford, a professor emerita at UC Santa Cruz. He's the author of books that explore the intersections of anthropology, literature, and art. The Predicament of Culture, 1988, Roots, 19, Roots meaning R-O-U-T-E-S, 1997, <laughs> and Returns, Becoming Indigenous in the 21st Century, 2013. In the latter work, he writes at some length about Krober, Ishii, and the colonial legacies of ethnography museums. So um, we begin with Andrew. I have notes, I'll try not to read them, but I'll sort of read them, so we'll see how this works. Um, does this work? Yeah. It's really exciting to be here with four of my intellectual heroes, and I am uh, looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. I am a linguist engaged with California languages, both as they are spoken today and as they have been recorded over 125 years in documents that currently, documents and sound recordings that currently sit in archives. A figure in whose intellectual shadow I therefore unavoidably work is the Berkeley anthropologist and linguist, Alfred Krober, whose nachlas I have used probably every week, every week for 20 or 25 years. In 1960, the year of Krober's death, a new campus building housing the anthropology and art practice departments and the anthropology museum was named after him. 60 years later, on July 1, 2020, an anonymous proposal to remove his name from that building was submitted to the chancellor's office. The building was officially unnamed, as you all know, on January 26, 2021, so almost um, three years ago. My book is not about whether Krober Hall should have been unnamed or not. Um, if that's what you want to learn about, you can ask, but uh, that is not what the book is about. I do think it was good to change the name, as Leanne mentioned, um, for what it's worth, but that is not the point of the book. The proposal to unname Krober Hall and a lot of the discussion around the unnaming included assessments of Krober's work that did not match my own sense of what was important in that work. I wrote the book to grapple, grap, grapple with this dissonance and try to understand his legacies. So it is specifically about Berkeley and California, and more generally, it's about the history of academic relationships, especially on the part of linguists and anthropologists with indigenous people. It's also about the work of scholars and scientists embedded in an extractive colonial system. The book has two main arguments. Um, and maybe I'll point a little bit to the chapters in which they sit, or maybe I won't because the correlation is imperfect. One of the arguments is parochial about Berkeley, specifically about the actual unnaming of Krober, Krober Hall. That sits mostly in chapter 10, Institutional Elisions. In that chapter, I document how a campus review process did not do any assessment of the proposal's charges against Krober, how the chancellor then presented the charges in the proposal as if they were the judgment of the review committee and how they wound up widely disseminated in the media as campus judgment. By looking at the context of these choices, I try to account for this canonization of false facts, a phrase that Meg Conkey taught me. A second argument, um, and I think more interesting ultimately because it's less parochial, is about the legacy of Krober and his colleagues and protégés. He himself was opaque often as to the, his motivations and what he thought was important. So I sometimes use his daughter Ursula Le Guin's anthropological fiction to read his work. Um, okay, uh, I have some examples to show potentially. <laughs> um, uh, I sometimes use Ursula Le Guin's anthropological fiction. She has a lot of anthropological fiction in order to read um, to read the motivations of her father and to understand why he did what he did. I argue that what is most important today about what he did do is the documentation of indigenous languages and stories and making space for many dozens of indigenous people to tell and write their own stories, stories of all kinds, creation stories, anecdotes about daily life, um, stories about genocide, um, stories about food, um, stories, anecdotes, conversations, um, all kinds of stories. Um, dozens and dozens of people told these in, in thousands of pages. 
In the dis discourse around Kroeber and Kroeber Hall, indigenous languages and stories were elided. Um, this is partly a consequence, I guess, of the sort of separation between anthropology and linguistics that happened in the academy over many years. Um, at a certain time, they were more closely connected, and the linguistic side of his work could be seen as part of the oeuvre. Nowadays, language is, belongs to linguistics, and so that work is kind of ignored. A small example, um, a small example is a book of quote unquote reading lessons made for the famous Yahi man called Ishi. Um, this is what they're called reading lessons by either by Theodora Krober, his widow, or by the catalogers in the in the library. Um, these are actually writing lessons um, made in an attempt to teach Ishi to write his language, presumably in the hope that he might want to write down stories or life experiences. You can tell that they are writing lessons, not reading lessons, because um, each page consists of a set of transcribed words that end with the same syllable. The syllable is underlined. So on the left page, it's he. The middle page, it's na. The right-hand page, it's c. C, it's a retroflex uh, s. Um, if you were trying to teach somebody how to write he, you would not teach them to write hi. Um, that is not, does not spell he in English. Um, if you were trying to teach them how to write C, you might teach them S-E-E -E or maybe S-E-A or something. You would not teach them to write S-I. So this would have been a really, really ineffective way of teaching him to read English. But um, Kerber was very interested in helping people to learn to write their languages. Um, and that is obviously what this actually was. Um, the book, this book, this booklet, um, it has been interpreted as an instrument of Americanization when it was apparently actually meant to facilitate Ishii telling the stories that everybody says he loved to tell. So this is just a small example of um, the way in which uh, the way in which specifics got misinterpreted um, and uh, the story recording aspect of Kerber's career has been kind of lost. In several of the book chapters, I document Kroeber's networks of connections with indigenous people and communities in and near California for recording their stories and languages. An example of this network of indigenous intellectuals, which Nan already kind of alluded to, is Gilbert Natchez, um, this person in the middle, an artist and musician from a prominent Cuyutacate Paiute family, whom Kroeber taught to how to write his language, um, the language that uh, called Paiute or North, Northern Paiute, taught how to write his language in 1913 and 1914. He was probably the first writer in his language. He made sound recordings of dozens of songs and stories. He um, created a large corpus of written stories and language information. Natchez published a paper or a short monograph of stories in the language that's shown at the top left. Um, but most of what he did with Kroeber remains in manuscripts and sound recordings, like these that you can't really see very clearly. Um, this thing on the left is um, an illustration of um, plant parts labeled um, with the names, um, and these names are not all, uh, not all recorded in subsequent literature. The middle slide is a list, part of a long set of pages and pages in his uh, vocabularies, a list of non-traditional words, words for introduced technological objects, um, not all of which are listed in the massive Northern Paiute Dictionary that was published a few years ago. And the uh, thing on the right is, a, is his, Natchez's hand transcript of a conversation that he recorded between him and a cat um, in which he says, in effect, he says, hey, kitty, don't you want some food? Don't you want some food? Here, kitty, 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 kitty. And then he sings the meowing of the cat. Um, so, like, he has this really awesome, um, rich, diverse uh, set of recordings that he also transcribed. In their language work today, the Pyramid Lake, Paiute, uh, Pyramid Lake, Lake Language Program um, works actively with Natchez's material, and they have expressed appreciation for what he was able to do in this quote that I put here. This is not rare. This is typical. Throughout California, the documentation created by Indigenous people working with Kroeber and his immediate circle of students and younger colleagues is the basis for cultural and linguistic reclamation. I am also interested in how documentation acquires a renewed political life. Um, language can be a key piece of political activism. So throughout California, we see linguistic knowledge reclaimed from archives for indigenous self-insertion. The name of a mountain range, 
That's the top example here. The name of a mountain range was reclaimed from Prober's 1902 Wiat language notes with Blue Lake Bob um, for the purpose of pushing back successfully against an industrial development project in Humboldt County. Um, and so the picture on the right shows a banner, um, protect Sakiewit. That name was recovered from uh, the notes that you see on the left. Uh, the words for people, Mubakma, and for their language, Lisian, um, those words, uh, I've lost my place, sorry. Um, those words in the indigenous language of the East Bay, first recorded in 1904 by Krober at the Verona Rancheria, are central for two of the political entities of indigenous people of the East Bay. Like all of us, Krober was a mixture. He was an extractive researcher who could often be paternalistic. Um, as Leanne mentioned, he had some unappealingly Victorian attitudes, um, and he was committed, like so many people unfortunately were at the time, he was committed to the idea grounded in essentialist nationalism, the idea of vanishment, um, which was the hugest of possible mistakes. But throughout his career, he advocated for indigenous land and cultural rights more than most people in his field. And he was a vocal opponent of the eugenic and evolutionary thinking that often dominated the discourse of the time. My book's first chapter has as its epigraph a quote from Ursula Le Guin's 2006 book, Voices. That's here. Um, because her fictional character, Oric Caspro, described very well what also mattered, in my opinion, in her father's work, finding what other makers made, speaking it, printing it, recovering it from neglect or oblivion, relighting the light of the word. This is the chief work of my life. My main argument in the book is that the chief work of Krober's life, we can now see in retrospect, was to record indigenous stories and languages and to find ways for indigenous people to tell their stories, and that it matters very much today that he did that. So that's the book. <laughs> Andrew Garrett has done us all an immense service by writing this book. And my first word to him is thank you. The care, craft, and empirical heft of the book are everywhere evident. It is dense with information and anyone would learn from reading it. I certainly learned a lot. We learned so much about Krober about research in his time, and about indigenous people and individual persons with whom Krober maintained sometimes long and dimensional relationships. On these grounds alone, the book takes its place among the best work in the history of our field, in my opinion. And I dare say, with his background, quite likely only Andrew could have written this book. It is also a courageous book and one that required meticulous care with the authorial voice and how it positioned itself in relation to the field of anthropology, to Krober, and especially to indigenous peoples of California. I especially respect the care and circumspection the book expresses in the matter of moral ethical evaluation of Krober. Andrew is very careful to avoid the ever possible anachronism of critiquing Krober by criteria that simply were not in the discourse space he occupied, particularly in the first decades of his career, which is upwards of 100 years from now. Critique need not be anachronistic, of course, and I'm not suggesting it is, nor is it unwarranted, but it does raise productive questions. And this book is a valuable exemplar of how to tread fine lines. Regarding vanishment, I wonder where the line is between a destructive ideology that presumes it to be natural that indigenous people will cease to be versus an assessment of inevitability based on having considered with a sick heart the scale, raw violence, and gluttonous self-interest of those who slaughtered, dispossessed indigenous peoples of their lands and put their children in schools where they were not allowed to speak their own languages. Would it have been entirely unreasonable to assume that indigenous peoples were under massive threat of destruction? What part of this vanishment thesis is due to that, in addition to the projection that Andrew mentioned? <clears throat> and here I quote Andrew, 
Boaz and Krober wrote as if assimilation and vanishment were inevitable, but the extent to which they acted in concert with the settler state dispossession is another matter that's typical of the care with which the voice is crafted. I think we all know what he's saying. I was intrigued by your argument, Andrew, that essentialism, historical particularism, cum relativism, and vanishment form a tight cluster of assumptions. Of these, essentialism seems to me the least obvious. You suggest that essentialism erases history, but Krober was committed to history, and Boaz might have been wary of historical explanations, but he never denied history, to my knowledge. When Boaz told Krober in, 19, in 1899, I'm quoting now Ira Beckness, in 1899 to find, quote, what is characteristic of the life and mode of thought of the Indian, there is no temporal predicate in that statement. It doesn't do anything about time. The, the Indian is a problem, but that's a typification problem, not a temporal problem. These three ideas Boaz and Krober shared, but whereas Boaz was wary of historical reconstructions, Krober was committed to history as one of the core contexts of the indigenous languages. I had not been aware of the importance of his work on the classification of the languages of California, nor I'm ashamed to say of his work on noun incorporation, which is such an important feature in many American languages, including Yucatec Maya, the one I work on. The 1911 exchange with Sapir in the American Anthropologist, which I read chasing out the references, is highly instructive and I recommend it. For those of you who may, might not have had a chance to read this book, let me give you a glimpse of the scope of Krober's field work and documentary contributions. 1,000 plus audio recordings of more than 40 different languages. The classification, which was the standard in the discipline of his time. The unparalleled amount and scope of field work that Krober did including bringing, bringing people with him for family vacations all summer as part of the family. By way of concluding these incredibly terse remarks, eight to 10 minutes is impossible, um, I wanna say a couple of words on place names. This is an area in which indigenous languages of California and elsewhere in North America are exceptionally rich. Krober's junior colleague, T.T. Waterman, published in 1920 his Yurok Geography, which I also got and read from, which drew heavily on Krober's fieldwork and cataloged with sometimes extended description over a thousand place names. The Yurok elder Domingo Jack observed, you guys, meaning Krober's people, claimed the land was not Megatol, Megatol, uh, owned, glossed, owned, or cared for, whereas it is owned and cared for. Along the river, everything has a name, and the name is the proof that it is cared for. As Andrew observes, such naming is a claim of sovereignty. We might say for a place to have a name is a sign that it is cared for by those who, quote, own, end quote, it, although the verb here opens a can of worms regarding the nature of ownership, especially of land. Maybe it's easier or more accurate to say the people who belong to it. He also demonstrates that toponyms are semantically dense descriptions of places, like what Sapir called compressed little word poems. Here are a couple, a place name, where water backs up. That refers to a village at the mouth of a river. Where rock speak, speaks, referring to a, spa a place with an overhanging rock, which creates an echo when one speaks in its presence. Where, ch my, one of my favorites, where children sit, which refers to a boulder in the middle of a river, quote, where some owls carried off some children and left them to sit, the children eventually turned to stone. 
One is reminded of the stunning research done by Keith Basso on place and toponyms in Western Apache. A classic example from the Apache would be, quote, water flows inward underneath a cottonwood tree, which refers to a place. This description refers to a very precise place on the, on the, on the land, but it is cast also from a very precise vantage point. You have to be standing in the right place to see the scene that is coded in the name. The use of the name, therefore, projects the addressee into the perspective point, looking upon the place from just the right angle that also evokes ancestral events that happened there. In short, place names are an idiom of historical consciousness, the deep time, and the ground of reciprocal ownership or care between the people and the land. Maybe this could help us think of the unnaming of Krober Hall and the myriad renamings of place wrought upon the people of California. Okay. <laughs> um, I was a little perplexed by um, the invites, uh, but I've known uh, Andrew long enough to know that he, he needed to throw a, a kind of a wrench in the, the deal too. There, there has to be some un, un, unexplainable thing happening. Prober is a very strange phenomenon for Native peoples. And uh, uh, depending upon where you go in the state, there can be a very uh, uh, cold, you know, uh, response to just his name in general, that certain uh, families have grown up with this idea that this was not a good, um, this what what happened was not good. And like you said, he got painted with a pretty wide brush with uh, a lot of pretty bad things that did happen to Native peoples. So he was just included in that. He's He was... We call up Hunton Hitch White Man, and um, so uh, there's that, I guess, um, as well. That we have uh, um, we have a long history of uh, people coming in, really paternalistic kind of very uptight white men coming in and doing things with our people, and. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around a really uptight white man, but they're very, they're not, they're not very fun, you know? And uh, so, you know, so uh, our life is not, is not uh, one about uptightness necessarily. Uh, I am a grandfather. And so um, for me, I see how important our, you know, inter, relations with my family, with my community, with all of our people, that it's such an important, our cultural uh, existence uh, really is a really engaging. I could see how, you know, if Krober comes into a community, uh, I remember, um, what's his name? Uh, the, uh, um, Tim, uh, uh, Thomas Buckley when he came in, and a very tall guy, for those of you who know him. So he was uh, uh, too tall for, after the first uh, trip to the to uh, the Klamath River. So he was too tall, and that's all people knew him as. And uh, here he was doing all of this research and all of that. And, oh, he's too tall, here he comes. It's like, and so it was like, he. you become a part of that community and you, and you don't escape the, the, the descriptions that you know we would place on, on place. We also do on on a person. So each person eventually becomes who they they are within that community. So Krober, uh, there's I guess there's two stories. There's one there's kind of historical view and perspective that says that um, uh, debates on how good or how bad Prober was. And that, but there's also this other side, which is the, the, uh, the life, I guess, 
of the community of, of our people and how we all kind of fit in uh, within that community, either as a you know outsider coming in or as an outsider coming in and trying to understand, you know, and appreciate what is happening within that community. And um, so uh, I guess towards that end, in a way, I'd like to introduce uh, two students uh, that are here. Uh, you guys, can I get you the guys to stand up? Yeah, and so they're all descendants of people who worked with Kroeber, you know. So these are great grandkids of of uh, Ellen Grant and um, uh, the interpreter who worked not with Kroeber, but with um, Bill Bright. So he was the interpreter. She was the interpreter for uh, for Bill Bright, and so in a way, that's you know Kroeber. And then next to them are two people, and they're they're the uh, granddaughters of uh, Julia Starrett, and so who is another one of uh, one of the language people that uh, that not Krober personally, but his students. So that's what I see when I think of Krober. I think of all of the great opportunities that he had to come and be a part of our community and never did. So he would send people, you know, to uh, come in and, and do work with folks. And, and that was, uh, I could think of um, the Danish uh, uh, Uldal, the Danish linguist who came in and worked with all of these people in a little place called Quartz Valley and way back in the mountains and got these fantastic stories and, and um, uh, I guess the process of, uh, of uh, uh, I guess his, his need to keep sending people to our communities, for the uh, Kaduk community primarily I'm speaking of. So he was a very important uh, uh, person is for the Kaduk people. Uh, on the other hand, there's other tribes that may not have that kind of a of a relationship with Kroeber, or maybe he's been, you know, painted that wide brush is painted, and he's now included with uh, with uh, a bunch of um, bunch of ne'er do wells, I guess you could call them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm I I'm very conflicted about. Because I think uh, as an artist, my idea has been one, when I was here at Berkeley uh, as, a, as an employee at the, at the museum, I had all of the old school muse museum folks uh, were the people I worked with. And they were all, you know, I guess died, kind of died in the wool proberites or whatever from that generation. And... Um, and it was a very, you know, very uh, almost like business, like business. The, the idea of Nagpra was just, I mean, the unnaming of Krober was a, a problem, but Nagpra, boy, that was real. That really got him up. The, um, the disgruntledness of it all. And uh, so, anyway, uh, but Krober, uh, like I said, uh, during my time, here, uh, I would always go to Kroeber Hall, and it just seemed so odd. You know, here I am, I'm, there's Kroeber Hall. It's like, oh, okay, so I'm walking through the door, and then there's all of the stuff that's the photographs and the recordings and all of this material that was something that was just unbelievable. And my little workstation, you know, I had the I think it was like they would say that's the oldest chair uh, in the American Museum today from e from Egypt, and then you know then over here were all the glass plates of all the famous uh, uh, what was that book the Almas Ancestors book uh, of photos of mm. Robert's photos, and um, so I mean it, the, I was surrounded by this you know primary source 
material and it was I just felt you know as a native person I guess I don't see this the value of this particular thing um, uh, the way say an anthropologist might look and wonder about this thing uh, I I feel I can feel it like I I have an, an experience some sort of some sort of an actual kind of like a uh, feeling uh, that occurs that, you know, like uh, that person's spirit is there still. That I, I, I have to say that I really feel this. And that, um, so working in the museum was kind of always an, an odd thing, but, uh, but it was really uh, Krober's uh, legacy then fed my art as, as an artist this stuff has to um, be returned. So when I was doing all the research of all this material, including spending hours and hours and hours with Krober's papers, um, you know, trying to understand the person that wrote in such tiny little teeny letters, you know, who was this person? I mean, anal retentive to the max, I would assume. And um, so... But the the content of that was like so rich, and one sentence, I think you were saying something about the uh, uh, the uh, Herzog movie, and he was saying that you know, and the idea of these two eyes at the end of this movie, that was like that was the thing that made it in a way art that it was you'll never forget that, and so Krober's stuff, all of this work that he did with my tribe especially was very uh was very instrumental in a lot of my art um maybe not directly but definitely indirectly and uh one in particular when i was really beginning as an artist uh was a picture of um, ishi like kind of staring down and i must have drawn that picture 50 times or more and it was because the the expression on his face was so incredibly intense and um and i never could figure out what was he looking at and then I, and then later i i saw the full picture the whole photograph and it was him chipping napping uh arrowheads so that intensity and was so incredible, but that was like, so that was a whole uh, part of uh, my need to bring art into this transfer of the, this knowledge that happened in 1902 to, you know, 1930 or whatever, and then bring it back to the community and try to find ways of doing that. And um, so that's kind of what my art was at that point, was to return, return uh, say, the extracted. And I'll, at that time, I remember when I first uh, spent time in, in the, in the survey, and Leanne had let me in um, to sit with the, the stuff, because I was going through all of the Karuk stuff, and finding, you know, removing the the the, um, the stack of paper and seeing the dust kind of around where the paper had been sitting because nobody had, you know, moved the thing for like 10 years or something, you know, nobody had ever looked at it. And so I'm going through this stuff and seeing, you know, the most important, one of, the, one of my three most important things that, a uh, question that I've had about life, you know, and uh, philosophy and all of that. And and one was, um, we have a, a plant called kishwoof. And kishwoof is a very important, um, it's our best medicine, we call it. Anaishi, our best medicine. And uh, uh, so there's this in this old stack of, you know, of uh, handwritten notes was uh, this story that was like way off in this direction and then all of a sudden the end was and that's why this is our best medicine 
And so I had to kind of somehow draw this connection between these two things. But what ended up happening was it turned into a play, it turned into all kinds of different things in the language. So we were able to return the language, you know, the kind of iconography of, 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 uh, of the time and, and uh, including the songs, like, uh, so many different things that were able to, we were able to uh, uh, reverse uh, engineer Krober's work, I guess is what you would say, and return it back to its place within the community. So, and I remember this one old hippie guy that lived in Orleans. We did a we did a story about the Orleans maiden, and um, and how she turned into this mountain, the Orleans mountain, and uh, where Ruby's from out back there, and uh, uh, and. The hippie said, "Wow, I'll never look at that mountain again. The same, the same again. It's like now that person, that mountain has become a person once again. You know why? Why that person is? Uh, why that mountain is so important? And why that's one of the only spirits who didn't have a partner? And the sadness of that, and how that's where all of our bad feelings go." So you, she takes your hurt and grief and all of that, and so and so now everybody gets to see uh, and experience uh, Nominee Afafi, uh, or these men. But Krober, I don't know. <laughs> Andrew, uh, he was uh, very yeah. It's a very interesting thing. I. Like I said, I'm not coming, leaving this place, despising uh, Krober. And um, on the other hand, you know, I try to keep him at arm's length, at least, mm -hmm. at least this far away. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to read this so I stay in my 10 minute slot. Mm -hmm. Um, a few years back, I commented along with many others on the proposal to unname Kruber Hall, and I was pretty critical of some of the claims made in the brief against the individual anthropologist, A.L. Kruber. But in the end, I came to the same conclusion as Andrew Garrett. The symbolism of his name had become ineradicably painful for native Californians and should be changed to recognize their cultural resilience and present agency. My concluding paragraph, which I'm gonna read, seems to me now like a kind of liberal wishful thinking, uh, but despite my more pessimistic better judgment, I'm doubling down. <laughs> I wrote, the current movement for changing names raises important questions about our differently positioned assessments of a shared, sometimes ugly history. In conclusion, I'd like to urge that we not succumb to the blame games and scorched earth moralism so prevalent in today's political culture. I have recommended, as I did in my above, uh, an attitude, uh, I called it critical generosity, especially with respect to ambiguous legacies like that of Krober and of cultural anthropology. This means in the current context, renaming Clover Hall in a way that honors native Californian resilience but that also finds ways to publicly recognize and understand the continuing contributions of that building's former namesake and his changing discipline. This kind of thoughtful, informed, critical commemoration would be especially appropriate in an educational institution." End quote. <laughs> Whistling in the wind. <laughs> A similar sen sentiment I found was expressed by others, by Kent Lightfoot and his con very substantial contribution. And I noticed it too in Professor Ron Hendel's critique of the similar uh, unnaming of Barrows Hall, where we are now. I'm not sure what we all had in mind concretely, some sort of exhibit or a public discussion perhaps, or a teachable moment, recognizing the positive contributions of these colonial liberals whose failings are magnified in our current decolonial better judgments. 
we were asking uh, our community for something more complex than either condemnation or celebration. I didn't hold out much hope. Yet Andrew Garrett has provided what I asked for, a thoughtful, informed, critical commemoration of Krober's life and work, including the legacies of his changing disciplines, anthropology and linguistics. How will Garrett's complex, complexifying book be read, if it is read? Well, it, it, <laughs> it, will be it will be understood by some, mostly, but not only on the right, as a defense of Krober against ignorant, sanctimonious cancel culture. And by others, largely on the left, it will be seen as yet another whitewashing of settler colonialism and a de defense of paternalistic academic authority. What I appreciate about the book is that it rules out conclusions such as these and tries for a complex realism, an attitude of both generous comprehension and critical historical distance. In his opening paragraphs, Garrett forthrightly acknowledges the dissonance, he calls it, the dissonance in which he finds himself. He writes throughout as an engaged participant, not as an objective outsider. I mean, he's after all part of the, the tradition of Berkeley linguistics and working with California languages. Working happily in the California linguistic archives at Berkeley, He's brought up short by a native language activist who tells him that she always feels sick on campus, conscious of all the ancestral remains stored in those boxes. At the end of chapter one, Garrett summarizes two contradictory versions of Krober's legacy. One, a history of harm. The other, of generosity. One, a narrative of colonialist denial and paternalist dismissal. The other, a story of respect, collaboration in the preservation of heritage. His book, Garrett writes, is an attempt to understand the, quote, dissonance between these narratives, both of which he takes seriously. It's important to note that while he refutes particular claims, he doesn't say that one narrative is true and the other false. He allows different visions to cohabit uneasily in the book not seeking to reconcile them or to find a balance. Throughout its 11 chapters, his book, in the words of my colleague Donna Haraway, stays with the trouble. This willingness to explore the dissonance of irreconcilable stories is, to my current way of thinking, realism. History is ontologically excessive, multifarious, contested. A single smooth version is well, ideology. Prober mm -hmm. emerges in a positive light, to be sure. The book leans that way, no doubt too much for some, but it convincingly connects, corrects many errors and oversimplifications in the now widely accepted dismissive view of Prober, and his mistakes and omissions, as we now see them, are acknowledged uh, directly throughout. For example, Krober's cultural essentialism with its avoidance of historical invention and change is a recurring theme. This lack of analytic scholarly interest in real contemporary people is something Julian Lang has uh, effectively stressed. But the book is not only about an imperfect individual. Garrett shows how the name Krober today symbolizes the limits of colonial liberalism, the entitlements and omissions that accompany good intentions. And also looking beyond the man and his times, the name Krober also represents a tradition of research, collective and dialogical, whose consequences were and still are decolonizing. As an academic, I appreciate the conclusion that research matters, often beyond the intentions of the researcher. I even appreciate Garrett's willingness to rub the noses of non-specialists in linguistic data and technical arguments that we can't understand, though I think at times he overdoes it. Mm -hmm. A little self-indulgent there, Andrew. <laughs> it's good to make people, readers, grapple with unfamiliar languages, 
up close and to observe the detailed sustained labor by Krober, by his linguistic colleagues, and by his Indian collaborators like Robert Spott, Gilbert Natchez, Juan Dolores, and others that produces accurate descriptions and translations, that anal compulsive dimension, <laughs> which was shared by some of his informant, uh, quote unquote informants, <laughs> as Andrew tells us, getting it really exactly right. Research matters in more than objective ways. Science, empiricism, documentation are built from facts, things made collaboratively in social relationships. Facts are subject to reinterpretation in new situations. Research is thus historical in the fullest sense, it's overdetermined and unfinished. Gareth is the best work I know that grapples with the contradictions and unintended consequences of what was long called salvage anthropology and linguistics, now rebaptized as memory documentation. His approach rhymes with my own ongoing research in what I call, for a lack of a new name, post-ethnographic museums. The colonial collections currently found all over Europe, North America, Australia, and other imperial metropoles. Times are changing there in those institutions. Human remains and cultural artifacts in these collections can no longer be considered the heritage of an abstract imperial mankind or a decontextualized science. Under pressure from former colonial subjects, activists, elders, artists, these specimens and treasures have been transformed into unfinished histories, stories, sources of knowledge reclaimed and made new. I love Julian's phrase, reverse engineering of Kroger's work. In these changing institutions, what was even 10 years ago unthinkable, the repatriation of museum treasures is now everywhere on the agenda for museum professionals. Restitution imagined in diverse forms, scales, and relationships. I haven't found, uh, visiting these museums, I've not found any single politically virtuous pathway, but many specific entangled negotiations. Of course, there's plenty of resistance to change, obstruction, unwillingness to relinquish the authority of universalism, the privilege of being at the end or the cutting edge of history. But what I find in all this movement, what, what I find in all this is movement, history as process, inventive articulations of old and new, residual and emergent energies. I rediscover what Hegel called the cunning of reason and history, the surprises, what happens behind our backs, for better and for worse. In a time of confusion and pessimism, when so many trends these days seem reactionary, when liberal progress is anything but assured, the good news that accompanies the bad news of this indeterminacy can perhaps be found with Andrew Garrett's help in Krober's exemplary life, with all its contradictions. 1876 to 1960, Kroeber was born at a moment of triumphant imperialism, and he died as its hegemony was starting to unravel. He lived in a world structured by colonization, with its violence, assumptions of assimilation, and romantic archaisms. Within this horizon, I think we can still honor his lifelong commitment to what he believed was admirable and worth preserving in native Californian language and cultures. He thought these lifeways were doomed, but his work has contributed to their future. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, and uh, we are open now for questions. Yes. Uh, My name is Stan Farrar, I'm a Cal graduate. I didn't study anthropology or linguistics. I've been gone for more than six decades, and I'm from Southern California, but I was interested in this subject because Caltech has unnamed Robert Millikan, without whom you can't talk about Caltech since he was one of the founders. They still uh, accept that he got a Nobel Prize, but uh, <laughs> otherwise uh, they've taken his name off buildings. So I was fascinated by 
Professor Garrett's book and the approach to it, and I think it's an awesome piece of scholarship. But I think about all the uh, intellectual firepower that went into that, and it's going to go into all the other books that are going to be written uh, from here to eternity about people like Thomas Jefferson, because you resonate on vanishing. Well, if there's anybody, if there's any president in the United States who thought the Indians were going to vanish and he was going to contribute to it, it was Thomas Jefferson. So if you want to focus on Krober is a really, I, I know we shouldn't have skulls in the museum, don't misunderstand me, but Krober is a pretty minor player in the scheme of things. We have big players mm -hmm. in the scheme of things who, when the truth comes out, when the scholarship is produced and it's not all the pablum about cherry trees and crap like that, you're going to find out that Thomas Jefferson wasn't such a good guy after all, especially with Indians. So where do we go with this? Do we just say, let's use all the intellectual firepower to write all these books or do we just say, let's take all the names off now and give them mathematical notations or whatever? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I sometimes wondered whether the building that should be unnamed is California Hall. <laughs> um, if, if we're looking for a malefactor. <laughs> so, uh, as an like outsider, because I'm not growing up here, I'm not an uh, American nor a Native American, so I'm still uh, wrapping my head around what's happening here about this uh, unnaming thing. I mean, my I have two basic questions about the uh, claim, the claims made during the proposal of the unnaming. Uh, the f the first question is that I remember the second claim is uh, something about Krober and his colleagues collected the remains of the Native Native American is is completely wrong. Is culturally culturally wrong. So my question is, in the tradition. What did the Native Americans do with the remains? This is my first question. It's a very basic question. Very and the second question is that, so the third claim is that uh, something Krober stated back at that time is uh, culturally extinct, extinct. And my question is, what, is, what was the reason of this uh, statement? Is it like to raise aware awareness of protection this this uh, culture, or it's just uh, like his blind blind spots when he did his research? This is my second question, and also my third question is something. <laughs> so my my no the third thing is not a question. It's just something came to my mind because. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. I'm not a native speaker, so <laughs> forgive me about that. So it's a, uh, it's uh, okay. I forget the the third thing. <laughs> I think to um, answer the first question, certainly, what indigenous people would not want is for people to be in museums. <laughs> like there are many different burial practices around California and the world, but none of them included. Putting, putting people in other people's museums. Um, so like, I think there's no question about that. With respect to, I mean, this relates to what, the, the other question kind of relates to what you brought up, Bill, about the connection or the potential connection between essentialism and vanishment. Yeah. Um, like my idea, my sense of that relationship was um, if, you, um, if you accept, as, if essentialism, my sense of the of of the relationship was um, if essentialism means you got to have features X, Y, and Z yeah. in order to be authentically whatever, Yurok or Ohlone or whatever, you got to have features X, Y, Z. Then, um, since all cultures change, eventually people don't have X, Y, Z, and then they're no longer, you know, then they're no longer that culture because those are quote unquote essential properties. So that's how, that's the reason why I personally saw yeah. those two things as linked, and that's kind of what enabled him to call cultures "quote unquote" extinct, even though he knew perfectly well that there were lots of people around who belonged to those communities, um, but they no longer, in his opinion, had the "quote unquote" essential properties of those communities. Yeah, we, um, as a as a Mayanist who works in Yucatan, we call that the curse of the pyramid. 
<laughs> yeah. You're either pre you're either classic Maya or it's all polyester. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it, and it's deadly. It's a deadly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. I, it's a real ideology that yeah. one. And Kent has written really, um, Kent is somewhere here, but Kent has, Kent Lightfoot has written really um, compellingly about this problem in California. Hi. Uh, I spent many wonderful afternoons with our late beloved colleague, Ira Jackness, uh, who had worked a lot in the archives studying Krober. I imagine he would be, have a lot to say if he were here today. But one thing I learned from him that there's this uh, in the oral tradition of Krober around when they opened up the building in 1959 that uh, a year before he passed away that uh, there's two uh, stories that Ira would tell me again and again and I think I, it's fair for me to share oral tradition given that oral tradition is such an important part of this tradition one one he would say is that uh, Krober got uh, stuck in the the elevator that they still have problems with in that in that building <laughs> but the second thing he would say Ira would say to me is that uh, there was a sense that Krober was deeply uncomfortable about the building being named after him. And that, uh, and that might speak to Andrew's thesis too, about uh, his, his uh, desire to be somewhat um, anonymous in, in, in some of his research uh, that you shared with us at the beginning of your presentation. I'm not sure if there's any verification for that, uh, that Krober felt, felt that way. And he, of course he would pass away the, the year after that, but, I can't help but think, and I was thinking this during the, the years of debate we had, that Krober himself might agree that his name had been removed from the building in the possibility that he would not have wanted his name to be there in the first place. Yes, uh, this is a question for the, the whole panel. Uh, considering that the namesake of this university was a slaver who wrote pamphlets in defense of the institution and has had his name removed from a library at Trinity College in Dublin. What lessons can come out of this whole unnaming of Kruber Hall for a question that seems to uh, inevitably be coming for this university uh, at large? Uh, I wonder if I could ask a question about the paradoxes of temporal positionality. Uh, the uh, point of view of Kruber and company during the period we're talking about was one of being advanced, being modern, being ahead of a culture that was vanishing, the cultures that were behind. And we obviously feel uncomfortable with that. And yet we do it from a position which is, in fact, also that of temporal uh, advance, that we are 100 years after them. We are 100 years more somehow enlightened. We, are, uh, we have learned something that they did not know. There was, of course, a famous argument by uh, E.P. Thompson that we ought to avoid the enormous condescension of posterity, by which, of course, he meant not taking the working class uh, of Britain as somehow simpler than ourselves. But there was also a potential for the enormous condescension of posterity towards figures even like Krober. That is to say, our own position of being, quote, advanced needs, I think, to be at least relativized or at least qualified by the experience of their getting it wrong. That advance, however we define it, is not sufficient to justify critical judgment. That we have to have other standards besides simply being further along in a process which is not really progressive. My, my um, argument in the book is not as sophisticated as that because I am only a linguist. Um, <laughs> oh. But. Hold your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, my argument is, is, is that kind of what occupies that place is not that, not, that people were, not that people are doing that, but that elites in the university um, are generally uncomfortable with the history of the university and picking somebody to blame um, allows us to stop looking at Hearst and all the other people who are much quote unquote worse. Um, so like, as, as I say, near the end of the book, he winds up being the fall guy. Um, and I quote Raymond Chandler as saying that dead people are the best fall guys. Mm -hmm. um, because there are people who are still living who are responsible for quite a lot of injury. Um, and it's much easier to pick a professor who's long dead than mm -hmm. to pick uh, ancient patrons whose families are still, hello internet. <laughs> families are still influential and 
you know, living people who are still colleagues or former colleagues. I'd like to, Martin Jay's uh, question has sort of brought me up short and made me stop th start thinking because if it's logic, it, it's logic uh, uh, would go so far as to say don't don't do don't, never unname anything from the standpoint of some late you know more advanced knowledge you know some post colonial consciousness or whatever it might be some sort of virtue that's associated with the uh, an advanced perspective but and so then I think well do I do I agree with that I mean do I. Well, no, there are certain things that I think really do deserve a naming. And then there's those that are debatable. And then there are those that really don't. And so I think, OK, we're talking now about when I say debatable, we're talking about a context where there are actually substantial discussions and also where the process takes enough time so that people can reflect. We, we have a, in Santa Cruz an argument going on uh, about unnaming our community college, Cabrillo College, because Cabrillo, who was named after, was a conquistador and he did some bad things like pretty much everybody else <laughs> in his time. And <clears throat> the, the, the process got very fraught with many letters to the editor and it's now been sort of put on hold. And there's a way that the community is thinking about it together. And, and, and that seems to me right, however it turns out, you know. And the distinction I guess I might make between the sort of abstract, dismissive, we know better attitudes of, you know, some sort of politically advanced view that sweepingly strips away uh, lots of names. This one seems different in a sense, because at least in my working myself around to thinking that unnaming was okay, it really does have to do with a very specific local history and a community, the local history of the settler colonial institution of Berkeley in California, you know, in relation to the dispossessed populations uh, you know, who didn't go away and are now back. You know, it, it has a, it's a local story and it involves specific local communities in a way that some of the more sweeping dis dismissive ones don't. And in my feeling, I guess my feeling that unnaming in that context, that is a learning or a teachable moment of a certain kind and potentially, and I don't think this one, and I think Andrew's last chapter is devastating, in the way that the the um, ca casual and and, and self-serving way that the university uh, rubber stamped this one, uh, it, it, you know, covered its ass basically in this process, uh, but I do think overall unnaming Cobra Hall to make Berkeley a more welcoming place for Native people uh, who have have a long relationship with Berkeley, a, a, a fraught relationship. It, that kind of a naming, I guess I can go for. And and, uh, and, and uh, so I guess that's my, as far as I got thinking through your very uh, far reaching question. Can I add just a simple minded, um, like one sentence? It's <clears throat> what I hear is a thread in a number of the comments that what I keep thinking about is the effect of unnaming on the unnamer, mm -hmm. not on the unnamed, mm -hmm. but on the unnamer. And there, there's almost a reflexive sense that I think goes to something that you were alluding to, well, more than alluding to, uh, which is that if, if, I, if I condemn from a position that I consider better, I'm better. And the unnaming lets the unnamer off the hook, even when it's not as bankrupt as as the one as the last chapter that you demonstrate. And I think that's a, I think that's a very dangerous move. That is, and 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 I and I feel it it hovers like an atmosphere around a lot of the discourse, which is which condemns. Mm -hmm. 
because I because I'm good enough to condemn. Mm -hmm. Because I'm hundred years later and I'm mm -hmm. one, you know, like you said, you need different independent reasons for doing it, not just because we know better. We know better. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we don't know better, actually. And we need to do much more than change names. It, that can only be a beginning. We've got to get that stuff out of the museums. We've got to, we, we need to do something constructive. I mean, I also entirely support the unnaming. If it's an open wound, take the name away. The rest of the arguments fall away in my mind in significance because they're too dubious. And they're, and they're too, they, they reposition the one doing the critique. Mm -hmm. But if these are, op but if it's an open wound, yeah. be done with it. And I really like the suggestion that Cobra might have liked that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm done. Go uh, um, until about 10 after. Hi. Um, my question is just looking forward. You're still training graduate students. You have postdocs in your um, groups and labs. How is this moment going to impact the next generation of scholars in your fields? And um, do you think it's going to diminish the academic courage or, you know, kind of the ability of people to consider studying groups that they're not a part of? I'm just really curious about how you think this unnaming of Krober Hall and really kind of the erasure of his legacy on campus, although it is very complex and painful, how that will impact um, your scholarship moving forward. I don't know how students, I mean, yeah. I think it's quite different in different fields. Um, in linguistics, I mean, the, the Kroeber Hall business itself, I think doesn't have any particular impact. Um, that's just like a small perturbation or whatever. Um, but in general, the challenge of how to reconfigure the field of linguistics so that um, so that we are respectful, so that we include indigenous people, and we are respectful in our relations with indigenous people, so that this will not happen to us in a hundred years. Um, like that's an interesting challenge. And linguists have been linguists are behind. I don't know. It's always the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. It seems to me that linguists are behind anthropologists um, in that respect that anthropologists have been thinking about this harder for a longer time and maybe have gotten themselves into a bit of mm -hmm. paralysis. Um, but they have been thinking about it longer um, and harder than linguists have. Um, in the last, the very last chapter of the book, I do talk about a few ways in which linguists, I think, don't take to heart some of the some of what I think are the lessons of the Kroeber story, um, but some do and things are changing. Um, not a very helpful answer, maybe, but that's what I got. The kind of field work people do today is entirely different. Um, one of the themes in Andrew's book is about moving away from the sort of textual collection. It's not that people move away from textual or textuality. It's a move towards pragmatics and interaction. It's a it's a positive move, not a not a um, and 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 it generates a lot of stuff. But there's a lot more. There's a lot more there with how one interacts with. I mean, many of the most offensive practices that are, you know, that are reduced in relation to Krober, People just simply don't do that. Uh, I'm not saying they've got it right. I mean, it's kind of like you know, when things go off the rails, you avoid that particular one. You're going to have another problem, probably. You know. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a process. What there is that Andrew alluded to, and and Jim certainly knows because he's been a very, very important shaper of this. Um, I don't know of any field as given to self-critique and self-immolation. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean it though. Mm -hmm. I mean but the results can be paralyzed. Oh, yeah, well, when you're on fire, it's paralyzing. <laughs> Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a I, I would say it's like a constant struggle. So I'm a ling. I have a background in both fields, um, and I, I'm very into sort of arguing from evidence. Um, it's just the way I'm was trained and wired. Um, and the self critique, it is important, but 
at the end of the day, I want to learn about the world and I want to engage the world outside myself and my own shortcomings. Um, and I think that's, I mean, it, this is not an answer more than a kind of extended reflection, but it's really, um, it doesn't end this issue. And it doesn't, I mean, I'll just put a place marker for a different discussion because it'll take too long. But, you know, as a Mayanist, we have many analogs of what we're talking about here. Um, you, we have the killing fields of the 1980s in Guatemala and the emergence of the Pan Maya movement out of the ashes of that. We have the Rigoberta Menchu stole uh, Ballyhoo um, uh, and all kinds of displacement of Maya people and 500 years of colonialism. So this is, it's. It, I would say that I think the problem for an anthropologist is is kind of ubiquitous. Depending, it doesn't matter where you work. Anybody who works in the Americas anywhere knows that they are working in the shadow of Holocaust, almost. Well, Holocaust. Um, and so you're you're and you and you don't get you don't figure it out and get a solution and go forward. So I think with working with say PhD people who are really getting into the field and so forth. It's just a it's a it's a matter of problem by problem trying to think your way around it. Um so that's not a particularly convincing answer, but that's what I would say. Thank you. So you can go on there's two more questions then let's just not anybody else raise their hand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um I just want to preface my uh, question with a quick perspective. Um, I transferred from community college and I was like, wow, I get to go where Krober and Ishii were and I get to be studying anthropology is such a historic place. And I graduated in 2013 and I had a wonderful time here and I always recommend anthropology to everyone. And so years later, I'm sitting at home in quarantine saying they're going to rip Krober off the hall, his name, and I'm reading the reasons and I'm largely unconvinced by these reasons, even though I understand Kroger is controversial. And I'm thinking, what's happening over there? You know, and I couldn't find any answers or anybody having any discussions because it did look from where I was sitting, removed from the university, very reactive and and the politics of the moment, right? And and I was like, how did Kroger become the bad guy? You know. But coming here today, I've been looking for answers and finding your book and finding this talk, I just want to say that every answer that everyone gave, every statement everyone gave, I found brilliant and made me feel what I was missing, like, oh, here's the discussion. So I want to thank you all for that. And my question is, in thinking of how we can get out of this, what does the panel think of maybe something like in a name like Ishi Krober Hall? I know it sounds silly, but like maybe we're honoring a time and not a person, luck. right? That's history. I mean, anything's better than anthropology and art. I mean, come on. <laughs> anyway, that was just my question. Thank you. Call it Building 53. <laughs> what is in a Quonset hut? I, I, I just want to um, look forward a little bit because the newest buildings have that have been named, they're not named after people who've done stuff at all. They're named after donors. Yeah. <laughs> and they just, yeah, no, I mean, they just, the Meredith Morgan Eye Center, where I get my eyes done, is no longer Meredith Morgan. He was a be beloved dean for like three decades. And it's just been renamed after a donor. And they pushed his statue into the corner too. <laughs> so I guess mm -hmm. what's to keep, like, we have such high standards for who they're named after, but I mean, we take any donor that gives money that slap their name on a building. So, well, they'll be taken off when when we can ask them, "What have you done for us lately?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Um, thank you, panelists, for a wonderful panel discussion, and thank you, Andrew Garrett. <laughs>